Luke chapter 7 is where we are. This is the story at the end of the chapter, starting at verse 30, 36. Um, my Bible is subtitled, A Sinful Woman Forgiven. This is verse 36 down through the end of the chapter. It says, Then one of the Pharisees asked him, that is Jesus, to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now the Pharisee who had invited him saw this. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. So he's, he's saying this to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And so he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Let's pray once again now for our Bible study. Lord, we thank you for this time and your word. We pray that you would use this story to speak to our hearts. There's much to learn from this. We pray that you would speak to us now and that we would have open ears and open hearts to hear what your spirit would say to us today. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. And everyone said, amen. This story is found only here in the Gospel of Luke. There is a very similar story to this found in the other Gospels, but it is not the same. The other stories speak about a woman who also uh, brings fragrant oil to a dinner party, uh, but that particular dinner party is at the home of Simon the leper. Simon the leper was different from Simon the Pharisee. Uh, the other Gospels that talk about a similar story mention that the woman who anoints Jesus with this fragrant oil was Mary of Bethany. That's where that story takes place. She was a righteous woman. She was the sister of Mary, uh, rather Martha and Lazarus. Uh, and she anoints the head of Jesus. So there's different aspects uh, to that story versus this one. They're not the same. This one is only found here in the Gospel of Luke. It is believed that this story takes place in Capernaum, although it doesn't specifically say. What we do know is that Jesus is invited to dinner at the house of a Pharisee. We learn his name in verse 40 when Jesus addresses him by name, Simon. In Hebrew, his name would be pronounced Shimon. Shimon in Hebrew means to listen or to hear. And it tells us that Simon is a Pharisee. So that's where this dinner takes place, at the home of Simon the Pharisee. Now, a little bit about Pharisees, in case you're not familiar. They were very strict, religious, observant people. Uh, Pharisees were a sect uh, within Judaism. In somewhat of a similar way, not exactly, but just, just to kind of illustrate, within Christianity we have different denominations. We have like Methodists, Lutherans, Baptists. So within Judaism in the day, there were also different sects within Judaism, and Pharisees were one of them. And um, they were known for their very strict adherence to the Mosaic Law. Uh, now, nothing wrong with wanting to obey God's law, except when being right is more important than doing the right thing. And there's a big difference. 
You know, some people are so bound and determined to be right that they don't always do the right thing. You know, if, you, if you're driving your car and a passenger in your car is starting to have symptoms of a heart attack, doing the right thing would be going ahead and gently breaking the speed limit to get to the hospital to save your life's friend. Okay, now that might technically be, you know, breaking the law, but it's doing the right thing under the circumstance because there's an urgent emergency here for the well-being of your friend. You know, you never would want to be in a car driven and having a heart attack driven by a Pharisee. Because that Pharisee is going to be like, I'm sorry that you're having chest pain and you can't feel your, your left arm, but uh, I'm driving 35 miles an hour whether you like it or not. And they would be happy to watch you die than to break the law. That's the way Pharisees are, you see. And Jesus had many confrontations in the course of his ministry with Pharisees for things just like this. In fact, there's a whole chapter, you could read it later, but it's Matthew 23, where Jesus rebukes Pharisees because of things like this. And in Matthew 23, Jesus calls them out for three particular things. One was lording their authority over people. He called them out on that. Two was because they loved public recognition. They loved, you know, to be noticed in, in public. And three, he called them out for their strict adherence to the minutia of the law while at the same time neglecting the weightier matters of the law like justice and mercy and faithfulness. Jesus specifically says that in Matthew 23, 23. He said, you know, you, you're, you're following the letter of the law, but you're neglecting the weightier matters like justice, mercy, and faithfulness. So there were many different times where there was confrontations with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were very religious people, and, and as such, they were often in opposition to Jesus because they didn't think that Jesus was as religious as they. And they didn't, certainly wasn't as observant as they. And they also, by and large, did not believe his claims that he was God. They rejected him as Messiah. So they were often um, hostile towards Jesus, uh, trying to always pick a fight with him. Now, when we come to this story, however, in Luke 7, there's a different tone here. Even though Simon is a Pharisee, there's no reason to believe that he has ulterior motives. Uh, all that it indicates to us is that he genuinely wants to get to know Jesus and to be hospitable to him. And so he's invited Jesus to his home to have dinner. And Jesus goes. And what we read here in the story is that Jesus then reclines at the table to eat dinner. Now, I read from the New King James Version, uh, and in New King James it says that he sat at the table. Some of your translations more properly uh, translate the original Greek language that he was reclining at the table. Uh, the, the Greek word there is kataklino. Kataklino means to stretch out and to recline. That's how they would eat at dinner time uh, in back in those days. The table was always low to the ground, and dinner guests would sit around the table like uh, spokes off a wheel, where they would generally lean on their left elbow, eat with their right hand, feet extended away from the table, and that's how people would dine, which is why it tells us in the story when this woman shows up uninvited that she, it says in verse 38, she stood at Jesus' feet behind him. See, because he wasn't sitting like we think in a conventional sense, like, you know, pulling up a chair. He was reclining, and so his feet were extended away from the table. In comes this woman off the street, and she's standing at his feet behind him. Now, who is this woman? She's not identified for us in the story. She's not given a name. But we do learn her profession. Because it tells us there in verse 38 that she was, quote, a woman in the city who was a sinner. That is a euphemism for a prostitute. She's the town hooker. And she shows up here uninvited as a guest because she had heard that Jesus was here at Simon's house for dinner. 
The door would no doubt have been propped open, especially in a warmer climate like Israel is, to try to catch a cool breeze. And so here the dinner guests are reclining at table. Jesus is one of them. And she walks in unannounced, uninvited, and she's carrying with her an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. This would have been a very expensive oil. In fact, Josephus and Pliny the historians say that this kind of a fragrant oil would have been imported from India, that it would have been derived from plants that grow at the base of the Himalaya mountains. It would have been a reddish color to the oil, and it would have had a very sweet smell. And it would, a single flask, alabaster flask of this fragrant oil would have cost a year's salary. A year's salary. Now think about this. So she comes in because she works hard for her money, and uh, she can afford this. But she comes in, and she has no problem breaking this flask and pouring this oil over Jesus' feet. Listen, this is a generous gesture of adoration, because she's, she's broken. She weeps. She weeps at His feet. She doesn't have a towel, so she starts to dry His feet, the tears that she's just wet his feet with, she dries his feet with her hair, she kisses his feet, and then she anoints his feet with this expensive fragrant oil. Now remember, you have to, you have to try to imagine the scene here. She's a prostitute. So when she comes in and starts doing this, you know everybody stops eating. They're all, they're all fixed on what, what is happening right here. And don't, you know, don't miss, don't miss the moment here, because one of the things in this story that I want us to see is not just what Jesus did, but what Jesus didn't do. And what He didn't do was withdraw from her. He didn't recoil. He just allowed her to touch Him and to do this as she was doing. But this would have been normally something that otherwise would have been a very awkward moment, except not with Jesus. But with anybody else, it would have been. I mean, let me translate this, you know, in modern terms. So, in a couple of weeks, I've been asked to go down to the Washington Hyatt to address a bunch of pastors. So, I'm going to go down there, speak to them. Let's just say, while I'm there, speaking to a bunch of pastors, that a prostitute walks in off the streets of D.C., and uh, she comes up to me like she's known me. And she starts, you know, weeping at me and, you know, holding on to me and, you know, starting to rub doTERRA essential oil all over me. <laughs> what do you think my reaction's going to be? My reaction's going to be like, whoa, I don't even know you. Get away from me. These guys are going to wonder where we've met. I mean, that would, have been, that would be like a normal, like, whoa, what are you doing? But not with Jesus. He, he, he allows this. He doesn't withdraw. And why is this important? You have to understand, you have, her, she, she has, she's coming here a broken woman, weeping. She is now remorseful and repentant about her life. And all she's ever known as a prostitute are men who have abused her taken advantage of her and rejected her. That's all she's ever known, are, are men that have rejected her, and perhaps for the very first time, she has met a man who has genuinely, sincerely loved her and not rejected her. So what he doesn't do is just as important as what he does do. He doesn't recoil. He doesn't withdraw. And so here she shows up at Simon's house to see Jesus. She's already a broken woman. And she is flooded with emotion that was no doubt a combination of a few things. And if you've had an experience, you know, what we call the come to Jesus moment, if you've had yourself um, an experience where you have come into a relationship with Jesus, you can probably relate to what's happening here because she's flooded with emotion that are probably, it's probably a combination of both remorse and repentance and regret over her sin. And on the other hand, overwhelming love and gratitude and adoration for the only one who can forgive her of her sin. 
that, that mixture of emotion, of just, you know, feeling the shame of your life and of your past and of your sin, while at the same time feeling this joy and this adoration for Jesus who can forgive you of your sins. Listen, the shame that bound her was broken by the love that found her. She, take that, Matt Mayer. She, she, <laughs> word, she <laughs> finally was free from the shame that had bound her because of the love that had found her. When she had this encounter with Jesus, she began to realize that her past and her sin and the guilt of it and the shame of it and the weight of it, the dirt of it, all of that was being washed miraculously by this encounter with Jesus, the only one who can forgive us of our sins. So she's, she's coming to him in this broken way. Now, because Simon, the Pharisee, did not understand any of this, neither what was going on in this woman's life nor his own need for forgiveness, he had a very judgmental thought towards her and towards Jesus all at the same time. And Luke records for us the thought of Simon the Pharisee. Now, I suppose, you know, at some point here, um, you know, Simon explained all this, what he was thinking, because, you know, we're, we're given a glimpse into what was going on in his head. You know, at some point, maybe Simon the Pharisee was even interviewed by Luke. And like, yeah, go ahead, write this down. Here's what I was thinking. I'm ashamed to admit it, but go ahead, write it down. And here's what he was thinking in verse 39. He was thinking to himself, this man, Jesus, if he were a prophet, he, he would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And notice, Jesus knows our thoughts, because the next verse, verse 40 says, and Jesus answered. And Jesus answered. Well, Simon wasn't saying this out loud. This was an inner monologue, but Jesus, knew it, knowing his thoughts, answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And so Simon said, teacher, say it. Yeah, he, he doesn't know that the hammer's about ready to be dropped here. Well, so Jesus launches into a little parable. He has a teaching moment here. In verse 41, he says to Simon, well, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. Denarii was a day's wage, so 500 days of it. And the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, both couldn't repay the debt, the creditor freely forgave them both. Now tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. And then Jesus summarizes everything in verse 47 by saying, therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. In other words, your love for God will be in direct proportion to your understanding of how much He has forgiven you. If you don't love God much, it's not because you haven't sinned much. It's because you don't understand your need for forgiveness much. Now, as I looked at this story and prayed about it and studied through it during the week, there are several angles that I could have taken in teaching this. You know, we could take the angle of the prostitute story. We could take the angle of the Pharisee story. We could take the angle of the topics of sin and forgiveness, because that's here. We could take the angle of generosity and love, because that's here. You know, all these different elements are here. But there was something that struck me from this story that I, I felt that God wanted us to focus on this morning, and it's this. The unique appeal that Jesus had to both, quote, sinful secular people like the prostitute and, quote, righteous religious people like the Pharisee. Think about how Jesus was able to relate to both. What was it about Jesus that made it possible for both, again, quotes, sinners and saints to feel welcomed around him? And here's an important question for all of us. If you really want to be a Christ follower, how well do we follow Jesus' example in that regard? 
Now, I'm not talking about this as some kind of a popularity contest, like how well are we loved or liked by all types of people. And after all, as much as Jesus appealed to all types of people, all types of people ended up crucifying him too. So it's not about a popularity contest. Jesus was never, you know, trying to win a popularity contest, and neither should we. Like, who likes us and who doesn't? You know, how can we be influential in that way? No, no, no. What I'm talking about here is how Jesus had a certain way with people that made him both relatable and approachable, regardless of who the person was or even how they lived. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that by being relatable and approachable that somehow then Jesus condoned their sinful behavior or overlooked it because he didn't. But Jesus had this wonderful way of loving people and relating to people that made both prostitutes and Pharisees feel like their lives mattered at the same time. I mean, I mean, think about this dinner party here. You have a prostitute and you have a Pharisee in the same room. People who are completely different, whose lives are on completely opposite ends of the spectrum, and yet both were drawn to Jesus. And I think to myself, how well are we doing that people would be drawn to Jesus through us? How relatable and approachable are we to a real world that needs Jesus too? But let me tell you something. It takes work. It takes work to find that balance in our lives where we can be relatable and approachable to those who don't know Christ as well as to those who do. This takes work. This will not come easily. Because let me tell you something, if we don't learn to find the balance in this regard, we will end up gravitating to the extremes. Life can be more easily lived in the extremes. It shouldn't. But our, our human tendency is just to start to gravitate towards the extremes. And so what will happen if, if we as Christians, if you're a Christ follower, if you don't determine and work hard at finding that balance in your life to be relatable and approachable to both those who know Christ and those who don't, you'll end up gravitating to the extremes. You will either end up parting with the prostitutes, living like the world, and then showing up to church on Sundays, or you will end up fellowshipping with the Pharisees. You will know your Bible inside and out. You will go to church regularly, but you will have little to no impact on a world that needs Him. And this is where we can end up. My challenge to all of us when I read this story and I look at Jesus' this wonderful, tactful, balanced way that he had with people who were in completely different extremes of life, a very, you know, pharisaical, very religious, very observant Jew, and, and a very worldly, sinful woman as a prostitute, and yet they were both drawn to him. I'm challenged by this. We should all be challenged by this. And as followers of Christ, we should all want to live our lives in such a way that we exemplify Him in this regard. Because sadly, the truth is, and I don't, I don't say this to be judgmental, I just say this as a matter of fact, and then you can decide if you fall in one of these two camps. But the fact of the matter is that there are some Christians who are living dangerously like the world. And there are other Christians who are living in a Christian bubble with no influence on the world. And we have to ask ourselves, am I in one of those? Because neither one is right. There's got to be somewhere in the middle where we are effectively used by the Lord for the sake of the kingdom, and we're relatable and approachable both to those who know Christ and those who don't. And that if we actually want to exemplify Christ in this way, we're, we're going to have to, you know, look at, okay, what are some of the things that He did? to help us understand how we can model this in our own lives. So I just submit to you five things for you note takers, five things for us to be relatable like Jesus. The first one is this, to live a consistent, uncompromised life. To live a consistent, uncompromised life. Jesus was not one way with one person or one group of people and another way with another person or another group of people. He was who he was. And, and, he, and he didn't shift colors like a chameleon depending on who he was with. He was just consistently uncompromised. He knew who he was. He, he knew what he believed. He knew what his mission was. And he was true to that. And, and he didn't, it didn't vary. 
You know, there's a, there's a conversation that some of uh, his critics, his skeptics had with him. It's recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22. I'll read it in a moment. And I'm going to tell you before I read what they say, that their motives were wrong. They're trying to butter him up with a little false flattery because they want to hit him with a question, a controversial question about taxes. But what they end up saying to him is a true observation, even though their motives are wrong. Here's the conversation. It's Matthew 22, verses 15 to 17. It says, then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with Herodi the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, the only thing from that story I want to point out is not the dialogue and how the conversation ended up and Jesus putting them in their place with a marvelous answer, but it's, it's the fact that even though their motives were wrong in trying to trap Jesus, their observations were right. And the observations they had about Jesus was A, he was a man of integrity, B, he always spoke the truth, and C, he wasn't swayed by people. If we want to live consistent, uncompromised lives, we got to learn those three things. We got to be people of integrity. We got to speak the truth. And we can't be swayed by people. We got to be consistently true to God in our walk in an uncompromised way. And this is not always easy, especially when you're rubbing shoulders with people who don't share your values and share your faith. It's very easy. I mean, all of us have been guilty, myself included, of gravitating towards people who don't share your values because you're, you're, you're wanting to have some kind of an impact. Well, we have to be careful of this kind of thing, because Jesus was never swayed by people. He was a man of integrity, spoke the truth. The second thing I see about Jesus that is good for us to remember, don't be judgmental. I think one reason why people felt so comfortable around Jesus, particularly those who were sinful, was because he never looked down on people. He never treated anyone like he was better than anyone else, even though he was. He never treated anyone like he was better than anyone else, even though he was. Now, this was Simon the Pharisee's problem at this dinner party. He was bothered by this prostitute in his house. Who, look, at, look at her. Yeah. And, and he was disappointed that Jesus allowed her to touch him. And so he has that inner monologue there in verse 39. He's like, if this man really was a prophet, he'd know what man or woman is touching him. Notice the end of verse 39. The last thing in his thought was that she is a sinner. Oh, and you're not? Oh, and you're not? But see, that was the problem. Simon couldn't see his own sinfulness because of his self-righteousness, which itself is a sin. He was so stinking self-righteous, he couldn't see his own sinfulness. And this can sometimes happen. I've, I've seen Christians, I've heard Christians, the way they talk about other people. You know, they can have this very judgmental attitude, and it's like, hello, do you not... Do you not even see your, your own issues? You know, so it's, it's like, you know, uh, I can't believe what kind of a cusser that person is. Yeah, but you gossip. <laughs> like, I can't believe, but they drink. I can't believe they drink. Yeah, they drink too much. You eat too much. <laughs> I mean, gluttony is a sin too in the Bible. It's like, I, I can't believe, they've got anger issues. Yeah, but you have unresolved bitterness. So, it's, so let me get this straight. So, so I guess that um, like a gossiping, bitter glutton is a better Christian than, than somebody who might have a foul mouth and drink too much and have anger issues. In other words, here's the deal. I'm, I'm not condoning any of that. We, we all need to, you know, say, Lord, you know, help me with, with my sin. What I am saying is that a sign of Christian and spiritual maturity is when you're more concerned about your own, more concerned about your own sin than the sin of other people. We can end up be, becoming so judgmental to other people and looking at their lives and, 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 and judging them that we're not looking at the sin in our own lives. And therefore, we'll be ineffective with people because we have this air of superiority and this judgmentalism that will render us ineffective for the kingdom. When, when we see ourselves as much in need of grace as the next person, then you won't be judgmental. I don't care what their sin issue is. When we look at our own sin issues 
and realize how much we need the grace of God, then we won't be judgmental towards others who also need the same grace. Number three, I've got to hustle through this because our time has escaped us. Don't be legalistic. There are some things in the Bible that are clearly spelled out as right and as wrong. Just clearly spelled out in the Bible. Some things that are right, some things that are wrong. But there are other things that the Bible defers to an individual's sanctified conscience to determine. Legalism happens when I want you to live by my conscience, and then I look down on you or think less of you when you don't. That's legalism. And Christians can play this game all day long. So you might have, you know, a certain conviction about something that someone else does not. But because it's not defined clearly in the Bible as right or wrong, then it is up to an individual's conscience to determine before God. And the problem we get ourselves into is when we have a certain conviction, but somebody else doesn't, and we think they should. Then we have this legalistic attitude which is not honoring before God. We have to make allowance for the fact, whether you like it or not, that some people will have some liberties in some areas that you don't. And you will have, vice versa, you will have certain liberties in some areas that other people don't. But we can't be legalistic about this kind of thing towards others. This is the problem of the Pharisees. You know, Jesus would heal people on the Sabbath, and, and they'd, they'd go ballistic over this. It's like, that's, that is the same as doing work on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do work on the Sabbath. They would never have enough regard for the person, the fact that they got healed. They were just all wigged out that Jesus did something on the Sabbath. They would also take issue with the fact that his disciples uh, did not fast. His disciples did not wash their hands properly. His disciples would stroll through grain fields on the Sabbath, pluck the heads of the wheat, rub the kernels in their hands to eat it because they were hungry. And you know why Jesus never addressed those things as being wrong? Because Jesus led with grace. The Pharisees led with legalism. Legalism will do nothing but alienate you with people. It'll destroy a potential witness. And it's the sister of judgmentalism. We can become legalistic in the way that we evaluate people and look at people based on their certain liberties versus our liberties. And we have to be very careful with how we come across to people who don't live just like we do. Number four, don't become isolated. Jesus went wherever sinners were. He went wherever sinners were. In fact, that's the very thing he was accused of by the religious, strict, pharisaical minds. They would look at Jesus rubbing shoulders with people who were, quote, sinners, and they were like, I can't believe this. And so just a couple of chapters back in Luke chapter 5, after Jesus selects Matthew, also known as Levi, a tax collector to be one of his 12 apostles, he gets accused of socializing with sinful people because tax collectors were not regarded in high esteem in the day, you know, kind of like, I mean, it's, you know, we don't want to despise anybody, right? But you're not really like buddy-buddy with an IRS agent, unless you are one. Uh, but, um, you know, and so back in that day in particular, a tax collector was lining their pockets by being the middleman, taking a little bit from the Jews before they passed it on to the Romans. So they were despised. And Jesus picked somebody that most people despised to be one of his disciples. And it tells us in Luke 5 that after Jesus picks Matthew as one of his disciples, Matthew invites him to his house for a dinner party, and he has a bunch of other IRS agents and other sinners come into his house for dinner. It says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, and then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
You know why he socialized with people who didn't believe always like he did? To influence them? To be able to, by virtue of his relationship with them, help them to understand what he came to offer? What about you? You know, we can't isolate ourselves in the four walls of the church and become exclusive in our Christian lives. Um, it's dangerous. It's unhealthy. It's antithetical to the kingdom. You know, people who are like, I, I go to church every Sunday and every Wednesday, and I uh, have my morning de devos constantly and consistently, and I have uh, a Bible study at work, too, with coworkers, and I, and I only read Christian books, and I only watch Christian movies, and I only eat a Chick-fil-A. Well, wonderful. <laughs> You know, that's great. All those things, all those things are wonderful. Except when that's all you do and you never rub shoulders with people who need Jesus. You know, I had to ask myself th this same question. Because particularly for pastors, we can become very isolated. You know, we, 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 we show up at church, we're around a, a lot of Christians, you know, I'm, I have the glorious privilege of being paid to study the Bible, right? So I read the Bible, I study the Bible, I talk about the Bible, I get to hang out with Christians. On a good day, most of my staff are Christians, and uh, <laughs> no, they all are, but, uh, but you know, Christian, Christian, Christian. You know what happens? We can end up living our lives in a little Christian bubble. We can live our lives in a Christian bubble, and we have no impact on the world. So several years ago, Sheriff Chapman asked me, would you head up a chaplain unit for the Loudoun County Sheriff's Office? And I, I prayed about it, and I, you know, and I thought, okay, this would be good. This would be good for me to get out of my little Christian bubble, hang out with law enforcement officers who are wonderful men and women, let me just tell you from firsthand experience. but. I thought sailors cussed. I'm telling you what. <laughs> Cops, they know how to cuss the bark off a tree. <laughs> I, would sit in, I would sit in meetings and, and the language was flying and, I'm, and at first I'm like, well, you know, because I don't hang around a bunch of people who, you know, talk like that. But it was good for me. It was good for me. Why? Because I'm like, oh, this is, this is like the real world. <laughs> But what would happen is a bunch of the cops would look at me and they'd be like, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, Pastor G. We need to put a cuss jar out. We need to put a cuss jar out. Every time we cuss, we're going to put a dollar in the jar. Let me tell you something. I've been able to buy a yacht. <laughs> Not really, but I said to them, don't, I don't want a cuss jar. No cuss jar. I just want you to be yourself. Because I had this moment of just like, you know, this is, this is actually... This is actually the way that the kingdom is supposed to work. We can't live in these little bubbles. Uh, a friend of mine about a year and a half ago introduced me to a couple of his college buddies who were Muslims. And um, one of them ended up not being able to get back to Lebanon because of COVID and travel restrictions this, this past summer. So Terry and I took him in and he lived in our house. It was good for us to have a Muslim living in our house, to get to know him. And his, his buddy um, is also a grad student at uh, Georgetown, and he FaceTimes me often, and he just texted me the other day. He said, when are we going to get dinner again? This is good, you see, because this is where the kingdom meets real life. And this is what we all need to be about. We can't get isolated. Last one real quickly. And I know this sounds super simplistic, but we have to love people. You don't have to love what they do, but you have to love their souls. As someone whom God loves and for whom Christ died, we have to love the souls of people. And then as God gives you opportunity, you tell them about Jesus. And you tell them your story. Because Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Amen? May we be relatable like Jesus.
Father, we thank you for this story that reminds us this tender, loving way that Jesus had with people. He was relatable and approachable by both those who were, quote, secular and sinful and those who were, quote, religious and righteous and everyone else in between. We pray that you would help us in a similar way to be so balanced in our lives that people would be drawn to Jesus through us. Forgive us, Lord, if we've been so worldly that no one can tell we're a Christian. And forgive us if we've been living in such a Christian bubble that we've had no impact on our unsaved neighbors or friends. So help us, Lord, to find that middle so that we can be used by you for the sake of the kingdom. Use us, Lord, for your glory and help us to be more like Jesus, to be relatable like Jesus. This is our prayer. Both prostitutes and Pharisees, thank you, Jesus, for setting that wonderful example for us, that we would follow in your footsteps to reach a lost world. We praise you together in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you all.